My name is Beth Guastella, General Manager for Joe Malone London, North America. And I'm truly honored to be joining you at Fountain House's special event today. At Joe Malone London, our mission has always been to create products that make people feel good physically and emotionally. For almost 10 years, we've supported those struggling with mental health through our UK charity program, empowering people to recover, reconnect, and grow. And today we're delighted to extend our impact to North America through a new partnership with Fountain House, whose extensive work supporting the dignity and needs of those suffering from serious mental illness aligns perfectly with our brand's global mission to stamp out stigmas surrounding mental health. So for every sale of our decorative white lilac and rhubarb charity home candle, which is launching today exclusively at joemalone.com and our freestanding stores nationwide, we will donate 70% to Fountain House to help fund the growth and expansion of the youth initiative and college reentry program. Thank you, Fountain House, for the tremendous work you do and for allowing Joe Malone London to be part of your continued mission. There is a mental health crisis in America. Depression is on the rise. Full-fledged mental health emergencies. Mental health and illness are underfunded. This affects every single family in America. Mental health in America has reached a crisis point. 13 million Americans, our loved ones, friends, and neighbors are currently living with serious mental illness. They face severe stigma and marginalization. While mental health, housing, and social systems lack funding to provide adequate support. Racial inequity and COVID-19 have caused vulnerable communities to be pushed further through the cracks. Undersupported and overlooked, millions of Americans languish in prisons, hospitals, on our streets, or isolated in their homes. We must take mental illness out of the margins and start reimagining the public health landscape. For more than 70 years, Fountain House has prioritized what's well about people to provide support in their recovery. We've pioneered an approach where community is therapy, rooted in dignity, respect, and humanity, to help our members reclaim their agency and achieve their recovery goals. Fountain House has built a successful and scalable model. 40% of our members are or have been homeless when they arrive at Fountain House, and within a year, 99% are stably housed. Almost a quarter are or have been involved with the criminal legal system, but our recidivism rates are less than 5%. Our members are hospitalized less and have healthcare costs nearly 25% lower than others living with serious mental illness. Fountain House works, backed by major new investments and replicated in over 300 locations in the US and around the world. What began as one community has become a social justice movement. We're ready to lead mental health reform across the country and to finally give people with serious mental illness the platform and the solutions they deserve. Join us. Hola everyone. My name is Fong Bui. I'm the publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail. I would like to welcome you all to Fountain House very special event, the Creative Mind and Mental Illness Honoring Agnes Gunn, otherwise known among us as the beloved Aggie. We are here to bring together the best of two Fountain House celebrations, one met about art and the other Fountain House Symposium. Thank you so much for joining us today in support of all the incredible and beautiful works of art that are made available from Fountain House and Fountain House Gallery for your potential collection. 
Yes, indeed. We are very excited and have a very jam-packed program for you today. First, we begin with a discussion from our brilliant friends, Kay redfield Jeminson, Lise Rexer, Isa Abraham, and Susan Spangenberg, as they explore the subject of creativity, mental health, and art as essential activism. We then lead immediately to an experience of virtual tour of Fountain House Gallery, curated by the remarkable partisan Sims, featuring Fountain House artists Lauren Burns, Sheila Horn, Angela Rogers, and Joanne Surreal. Then with terrific pleasure, we will welcome our honorary Aggie in conversation with her beloved friend, Darren Walker, the formidable yet benevolent president of the Four Foundation. But first, we will turn it over to our president and CEO of Fountain House, my friend and colleague, the only one, Lee, Ashwa Vassan, for a few quick words of remarks. Take it away, Ashwin. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Ashwin Vassan, president and CEO of Fountain House. And I'm so pleased to host this virtual event today and to share the Zoom stage with so many artists, advocates, collaborators, and supporters. Most of you are familiar with Fountain House, but for those of you new to our family, Fountain House is a national nonprofit fighting to improve health, to increase opportunity, and reduce social and economic isolation for people living with serious mental illness. We've been building community and innovating for more than 70 years and have a tremendous track record of success. That's because something magical happens at Fountain House. We're a place of belonging, a place of community that starts with what's well about people and builds from that to work together to define, support, and help them achieve their goals. In this way, our work is all about rights, about dignity, and about civic inclusion for a group of community members who have for far too long been pushed to the margins of society. That's why our program and the 200 others we have inspired around the country and another 100 across the globe are called clubhouses and the people we serve identify as members. There are 5,000 members in New York City and more than 60,000 around the country. These are people who have often faced the greatest stigma in our society, but here they come together by choice and like members everywhere, they belong. At Fountain House, they also receive the basic supports for social, economic, and human security that so many have lacked access to, including housing, healthcare, healthy food, employment, and education. We have an opportunity to see how artists are also pathfinders for social justice. Artists have been on the forefront of other social justice movements like civil rights, women's rights, and criminal justice reform. They play a critically important role in bearing witness to discrimination and in crying out for a better world through their art. We are now seeing something similar happen around mental health reform. That's critically important to our honoree today, Agnes Gund, who we are delighted will engage with us in an interview with Ford Foundation President Darren Walker to accept her award. Aggie and Darren are not only good friends, they are both philanthropic legends of social justice and equity, most recently working together to end the scourge of mass incarceration. These issues they care so deeply about, mass incarceration, racial justice, and police reform are deeply entwined with mental illness. Up to 20% of people in jails and prisons have a serious mental illness. One out of four victims killed by the police are living with mental illness. In a society that criminalizes and punishes mental illness instead of treating it as the health condition it is, change agents like Aggie and Darren have been on the front lines of advocating for a different world. And Darren and Aggie have proven that art and artists are key in driving towards social change and social justice, as you will hear. Social justice is critically important as Fountain House expands its work nationally. We are working with other clubhouses around the city and the country to build a movement that fights stigma and changes the policies needed to ensure that people living with serious mental illness are recognized for their talents and contributions and have the resources and supports to share them. I come to this work not as a mental health professional per se, but as a primary care and public health doctor and an epidemiologist. It's that lens that 
brought me to lead Fountain House because this is a public health crisis, an epidemic that affects 13 million people in America. And it requires public health solutions grounded in prevention, evidence, access, and equity. I also come to this as a family member who has loved ones who live with and have lost their lives to severe mental illness. So this work couldn't be more timely. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are perhaps for the first time as a nation confronting our collective mental health, trauma, economic insecurity, social isolation, and loss have afflicted all of us, but some more than others. COVID has brought into stark relief the scale of the mental health challenge that awaits us, but it has also ex exposed the inadequacy of our systems and our responses to mental health issues to meet this challenge. This we must change together. COVID has also once again pointed out racial disparities. Not only are black and brown Americans more likely to be diagnosed, to be hospitalized and to die from COVID, they are disproportionately facing the impact of the pandemic on their social and economic stability and on their mental health. We need a movement for change. And with Fountain House and our 60,000 Clubhouse members around the country, and with the support of all of you, our artists, our allies, our academics, and our philanthropists, we have the beginnings of this movement. We are all in this together. Thank you, Aswin. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. As many of you, if not all, might know that Fountain House Gallery was found in 2000. Yes, dedicated solely to exhibiting works of artists living with mental illness. And for those of you who haven't been able to visit Fountain House Gallery in person, today we have brought the gallery to you. Yes, indeed, this is a 3D replica with all the works of art on the walls which had been hand-selected and curated by Patterson Sim, a good friend of mine and Aggie, who is also the president of Leon Poxmick's Foundation and the managing director of Sol Steinberg Foundation. The floor is your, Patterson. Take it away. Hi, my name is Patterson Sims, and thank you so much, Fong, for being introduced by you for this wonderful and important event. I was very flattered when Fountain House asked me to be a juror for the show. I've worked with Fountain House a couple times before, and it's such an impressive organization that does such good work. At the core of that work for me is the work of the artists who are associated with this program and how those artists have really, in some cases, become artists as a result of the program, and in other cases, simply confirmed their creativity through what they do. But what was wonderful in looking at the 39 artists who submitted work for this was that A, I felt really strongly that everybody should be represented by at least one work. The space allowed a couple of the artists or a number of the artists actually to be able to get two works. And that was great because you could see something of their range. There wasn't really a theme that I was mindful for because it's, this is the work of really individuals and in very strong and um, very determined individuals who have their own distinct sensibilities, unfettered, I would say, by a lot of what makes the art world at the present moment, sometimes more monetary than aesthetic, and sometimes more about careers than really the notion that these are expressions that need to get made and are getting made. So it's the intensity of these works and the sort of honesty of them that really impressed me and impresses me in terms of this program. As I you know, have done a lot of curatorial work over the years, because I've worked at a number of different museums and had a chance to even work on things like the biennial at the Whitney Museum, which is done every two years. And it's fascinating to see how much of, of your time is reflected in, in the works of art at that time. But in this case, it's so much more about how much of the individual character of these artists is expressed in their works. And so it's a wonderful opportunity to support Fountain House and then these artists as individuals 
and to know that what they've done has reached out to you and been important enough to you to like certainly look at it carefully and maybe even take it home. I hope you enjoyed the tour with Patterson. Again, all of these original works of art made by Fountain House Gallery artists are made available online in our art auction, which is available at the link below. Please check them out throughout the event. But for now, I would like very much to introduce you to this year's speakers who will be discussing creativity, mental illness, and art as essential activism. Kate Redfield Jemison, PhD, is the Dalio Professor in Mood Disorders and Professor of Psychiatry at John Hopkins University School of Medicine. She is the co-author of Standard Medical Text on Bipolar Disorder. Kate is the author of national bestsellers, including Unquiet Mind, which chronicles her experience of living with bipolar disorder and touch with fire, manic depressive illness, and the autistic temperament. Lise Rexer is a member of the MFA faculty at the School of Visual Arts, a writer, critic, curator, and a frequent contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. Lai is the author of several critical volumes, including The Critical Eye, 15 Pictures to Understand Photography, How to Look at out, Outsider Art, and with Jonathan Lerman, they also published Drawing by an Artist with Autism. Isa Ibrahim and Susan Sprengenberg are longtime member artists of Fountain House Gallery. Yes, much of Isa's work infused the blow brow with the erudite, exposing the truth behind the fairy tale, what he calls a fun how reflection on a bankrupt culture. What a poetic description. Susan's work, on the other hand, is autobiographical, commenting on her experience in the mental health system, as well as touching upon all the relevant social and political issues. Please join me to welcome Kay, Lyle, Isa, and Susan. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. It's wonderful to be at Fountain House again, however virtually. It's such a wonderful group and you do such fabulous things. Um, I'm gonna talk very briefly about, a little bit about what we know about the relationship between mental illness and uh, artistic creativity. Uh, it seems counterintuitive that you would have a link between something that is extraordinary and uh, requiring a such great mental and emotional faculties as, as the arts and have that in any way linked to mental illness. But it's, a, it's an observation that goes back thousands of years. Uh, and in fact, has been backed up with a lot of uh, research as, as I'll get to in a minute. Um, I want to make a, a very strong caveat uh, that I don't want to romanticize bad illnesses. I have bipolar illness. I've had it since I was 17, uh, a suicidal form of it, a psychotic form of it. It runs in my family. I've treated it and studied it for, for decades. And um, many of my friends and colleagues have died of, of uh, bipolar illness and depression. But it is also, uh, these are interesting illnesses because they are kind of an exception in mental illness to where there's a certain at times in some people, a certain advantage. So clearly most people who have uh, mental illness do, are not unusually creative. And most people who are unusually creative don't have mental illness. But there is, um, I think quite well established now, a very much disproportionate rate, particularly bipolar illness in highly creative people. So let me just talk a little bit about what we know about how you, try and study something as uh, complex and, and, and fabulous as, as the arts, and as complex as mental illness, um, how do you try and study something in an objective way? Um, and the answer is it's hard, as you might imagine. Um, but we I want to just go through a couple of things. One is I want to give a little bit of the evidence that we have that there's a relationship, uh, particularly between uh, mood disorders and creativity. Uh, and then talk about possible reasons why that is. If why, why should there be, why might there be a relationship between mental illness and 
uh, creativity. And then I want to talk about some of the treatment implications that, that come as a result. So in terms of evidence, you can, you can do what people did for centuries, which is study individual lives, which are interesting. And you can see, uh, do people have a disproportionate rate? If you take a group of artists and writers, do they have a disproportionate rate over what we know to be the, the general rate in the public? Um, and you can study those lives. And as, as I said, it's interesting. It's not necessarily uh, terribly scientific or uh, conclusive, but it's, it's very interesting in its own right. Then you can do studies of uh, living writers and artists or uh, large groups of people who have uh, been studied to, to look at their diagnostic, uh, the diagnostic patterns and uh, what people, if, if when they come in and for a study, and you uh, diagnose them, do they have a disproportionate rate of mood disorders? Have they been treated disproportionately for mania or depression or anxiety? Um, so that's a second, a very large group of studies. And then there are more recently in the last 10 years or so, there have been a series of studies um, that are really very, very large population studies uh, ranging from 70,000 people to studying like one, one 0.2 million people in terms of uh, the relationship between uh, occupational su uh, studies of, of creativity and uh, hospitalization for mania and depression. So these are huge studies, I mean, very big studies. And uh, what we have found out as a result of that is that um, there's a consistently, uh, with a few exceptions, but strikingly consistently, there's an increased rate of depression of depression, but particularly bipolar illness in people who are highly creative. Uh, and this is true in science and business, but particularly in the arts and across the arts, particularly in poets, but also uh, in, in visual artists and also in musicians. So we know that there's an increased rate um, of mood disorders across these studies. There's also a very much increased rate of suicide um, in these uh, populations. Uh, which is obviously deeply concerning. Um, a recent study of meta-analysis, meta which just basically means you're studying a group of studies uh, to see what the outcome is across a large number of studies. There's a recent study of 150 studies looking at mood disorders and creativity, uh, which is a huge number of studies of anything. And what was found in that is that there's an increased rate of bipolar illness in people who are very creative, and there's increased rate of creativity in people with bipolar illness. Um, and you know, you, you could ask yourself, uh, why why would there be this level of relationship? And I think there are a lot of reasons. One is changes in thinking. So that, for example, in poets, uh, whom I've said uh, quite a bit, particularly Robert Lowell, um, in in poets there's a uh, increased fluency of thinking that's very characteristic of mania, of early mania, of increased number of asso associations, uh, uh, unusual and original associations. Uh, so there's a sort of a fluid thinking, uh, elevated mood that goes along with very fluid thinking. And these have been studied in all sorts of studies, psychological studies as well as studies in people with mental illness. Um, there's disinhibition, which is probably terribly important in the same way that sometimes alcohol can disinhibit people in terms of what they write, in terms of what they paint, in terms of what they compose. Mm. Um, but mania is sort of the ultimate um, uh, uh, disinhibitor. There's also risk-taking and certain fearlessness that are well associated with mania and grandiosity, expans expansiveness, or tendency to really hit for the fences, aim for the fences. Um, there's a uh, painting on, as it were, on a very, very large campus canvas. And then finally, in terms of treatment implications, um, I think it's important to say, I mean, you get asked, well, if you treat my illness, will my creativity go away? And the answer to that is the studies that we have indicate no. Um, one reason is these are very deadly diseases and they're very debilitating diseases. Um, they're also, uh, in the case of bipolar, it's progressive, which means that it gets worse over time. Um, so that's something you have to take into consideration. 
And we know that lithium, for example, is very uh, good at preventing suicide. Um, and this is a very high risk group uh, for suicide. And lithium also has neuroprotective effects. So certain has t tendency to be able to generate uh, uh, and repair uh, damage uh, done. So I think in this day and age, we have a lot of options and um, the important thing is to have a really good relationship with your doctor and therapist um, so that you can, um, under supervision, um, experiment around and, and change things, but to be uh, open to the possibility that, um, you know, A, you're going to have to, almost certainly if you've got bipolar, you're almost certainly going to have to be on meds, but you also almost certainly can keep at a much lower level than you used to be able to. So, thank you. I want to thank uh, Kay Redfield Jamison, uh, particularly for her work, which for me has been not only uh, tremendously insightful, but also in inspirational for, for the concerns that I've had for the last 30 years as a critic and a, and a curator. And, and, and that subject is uh, outsider art, which is the production of art by people who basically lie or, or, or who work outside the art world. Uh, and in many cases are people who are dealing with serious mental illness and are often um, or are often incarcerated. Those two things can go together. I want to take a kind of long view here um, and, and start sort of go as far back as we can to start. Um, I'm very interested in the idea of art that's made without permission. That is art that comes from outside the art world that doesn't require a sanction. And uh, again, we've been, human beings have been doing this for 30 millennia, at least that's, and we probably will go back, the more, more we investigate, the further we go back. Human beings have been making uh, remarkable images of incredible fidelity and quality for at least that long. And they've been doing it all over the world. Uh, most of this art, that is the art that's made without permission, that is outside professional spheres or outside, very often outside religious uh, institutions, has disappeared and we'll never see it. But some of that work has survived. And as we know more and as we appreciate more, more and more of it is being preserved. And as with Fountain House, it's being encouraged. One of my uh, most remarkable encounters with this work was uh, with a, an artist whose name was unknown at the time when, when I first saw, saw the drawings. It was a man named James Edward Deeds, who was uh, in an institution in uh, Missouri for nearly 40 years for a variety of really difficult situations that he encountered. He was, he was put in by his family, his father in particular. And while he was in the institution, began to make drawings. Uh, they were remarkable drawings and they only come to us because they were by pure happenstance, they were preserved from the trash. Uh, they, were, they were kept for uh, several decades. And when they finally began to emerge, we knew nothing about deeds. And it was the uh, investigations and the help of relatives who came forward, which allowed us to understand not only the source of his imagery, which is re really remarkable, but also the challenges that he faced uh, as an individual and as a creative person. Uh, Deeds is a kind of model in a way for an outsider. That is someone who was completely isolated in his creative activity, who drew on a variety of different sources and who did it without any expectation that the work would ultimately be seen by others. Uh, that kind of prototype is something we became familiar with or at least Western society became more familiar with in the 19th century. At the end of the 19th century, it was primarily artists themselves and physicians who became interested in work that was being done by people who were not trained as artists. And that work was being was acknowledged for two reasons, I think. First, by the artists, because the artists themselves were at that moment breaking down categories of representation. They were changing the way art was done. Modern art was essentially coming into being and the artists recognized as they were breaking down categories that work that was produced outside the realm in which they knew the, work, the, the realm of galleries, the realm of critics, the realm of art schools, and the realm of professional activity was often breaking the same barriers that they were attempting to, to overcome. At the same time, physicians 
were becoming more and more sophisticated and their conception of the human mind and of creativity itself was also expanding. And we have some visionary physicians and psychologists who were intensely interested in not only the creative process, but the actual outcome itself. And we're interested in collecting the work, we're interested in valuing the work and actually writing critically about that work. It was really that great moment where the notion of outsider art was really born. And it continues to be, I think, furthered by exactly those two groups. Even as the, the world more broadly has become more, more receptive to outsider art, not only acceptive, but, uh, but has embraced it. It's been, nevertheless, it's been physicians and artists themselves who have, uh, I think, have expanded our, our valuation of this work. Um, it was, for example, a psychologist, a man named Carmel Pasto, who working at an institution in California, identified Martin Ramirez as one of the great producers of so-called outsider art uh, in the 1950s. Pasto, who was giving classes at the institution in California, recognized Ramirez's his remarkable capabilities, helped collect the work and preserve it at a time when it was often the case in institutions that work was destroyed. It was seen as part of a pathology itself and was often not preserved. Um, this was before or in the early days of, you might say, let's call them art therapy programs. And now Martina Ramirez is regarded as one of the great Mexican artists. He's kind of in the pantheon with people like Frida Kahlo. Uh, again, when his work was dis discovered, he was considered to be an outsider. He was considered to be sui generis. Um, his work un incomprehensible to many, but over time with acceptance and critical attention, we understand a lot more about the sources of Ramirez's art. We understand who he was communicating with that is who he thought his audience with. And not only that, we understand his imagery. And Ramirez is, again, a kind of a model for the outsider, the ultimate outsider, someone who is diagnosed with a, a, a number of, uh, of uh, mental infirmities, including schizophrenia. He, Ramirez's his example extends, in a sense, as a type to many other artists who worked in isolation or have worked with, with psychological uh, challenges in their life. Probably by now, one of the best known is Henry Darger, who lived, he was quite reclusive. He was a janitor. He lived in Chicago and he never told anybody about the work that he was doing. He worked on his own in his apartment and essentially was a novelist, uh, an incredible graphic designer. And more profoundly, he was an artist who was locked in a kind of discussion with God about the nature of justice and sexuality and about good and evil. And over the space of his life, over a number of decades until his death, he worked in solitary on an epic that would detail the, um, uh, the tribulations uh, of a group of young girls in a world in which everything was arraigned against them. And working out that kind of argument with, with the deity, with, with the conditions of the world around them, I think is one of the things we have to pay enormous attention to in terms of the produ production of people who do the work, not because they're being paid to do it, not because they've been socialized into it, and not because they've gone to art school and understand necessarily the value to others of their work. Mm. But underneath it, they do it because they have a compulsion and they have a vision that they are attempting to communicate to whoever might find it whether it's no one or whether it's someone or whether it's only a few. Uh, this, um, this model of the outsider is one that we become very familiar with, again, because the outsiders have over time, through programs like Fountain House, which is enormously important, through many others like the Guggen Institute in, uh, in Austria, have brought, been brought into a mainstream. They brought in into uh, a world in which artists, individuals, collectors, ordinary people can begin to respond to work that's made by others that are often like them. And this bringing the outsiders in, this, how can we put this? This, it's not a normalization of the work, but it is a valuation of the work. It indicates to me a profound and really important shift, not only in the way we look at creativity, not only in the way we value art, it's a process that's been ongoing for at least 150, almost 200 years. It's changing in a, on an idea, 
uh, about who gets to make work and who gets to value work, but also it's a change, I think, in the way we begin to look at uh, the human person. And this is where I think it, the, the very presence of outsider art, the very valuation of outsider art, the distribution of it, the promotion of it, uh, as it becomes part of the mainstream, we begin to look at it not as outsider art at all, but as part of a continuum of creativity. And that's how I, that, that's how I like to see it. That's how the artists have themselves taught me to see it. And that in itself, I think the promotion of that idea is one of the most powerful forms of advocacy that in the art world that we can see today. Uh, it's uh, transformed my life as it transforms, I think, the lives of many people who encounter the work. And I think uh, Fountain House is uh, enormously important. That's why I've been so pleased to be able to do this. Uh, and, and to share some time with, with uh, Kay Redfield Jameson, who's been so important in our appreciation of what human beings can accomplish. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. That was a very enlightening overview uh, and very uh, inspirational. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Jameson, whose copy of uh, An Unquiet Mind I acquired while I was an inpatient in Creedmoor. And uh, it inspired me to write my memoir, The Hospital Always Wins. So that was a tremendous inspiration for me to find that book. Um, some 30 years ago, upon getting sick with mental illness and, and being diagnosed with schizophrenia, I started purging all that I took in from the media. Um, as an American child raised by television, it was painful and kind of cleansing to release myself from the mythology of pop culture, you know? Uh, and the flawed Superman and political heroes and villains that I paint are now a metaphor for sick society and my own psychological illness. Like this, I have a parallel narrative running through a lot of my work. Uh, surviving the trauma of racism and a psychotic break and a horrific family tragedy, I was hospitalized in a state of asylum for 20 years. But uh, I look at that as a mixed blessing. Uh, in that, though I was locked up indefinitely, I had the benefit of a dynamic art rehab program, Fremont Psychiatric Center's Living Museum. And there I painted every day, uh, building a body of work. Uh, I, I recorded a vast catalog of original songs, and once again, I wrote my memoir. And, and uh, I also learned to use my art to gain insight into my illness, uh, understand my trauma, and, and, and eventually to heal. But the greatest blessing of all was meeting the love of my life, Susan, there at the Living Museum. Uh, and some 26 years later, we were living together in an apartment in Jackson Heights. We, She's also an artist, and, and so we collaborate on various art projects. Uh, we support each other and have meaningful conversations into the night about art, culture, and life. And uh, having someone in my life who's, who's an artist, as, as well as I am, and also a sufferer of mental illness, uh, so that we can understand each other, what we're going through, good and bad, and have empathy toward each other. I really feel like I'm probably the luckiest and happiest man I know. So hey, Susan, to tell you a little bit about herself. I love you too. Um, hi, my name is Susan. I'm an untrained, self-taught artist. I started creating at a young age. I also started self-harming at a young age. Um, I didn't talk or communicate that well for much of my life. And that really left art as my language and my refuge, my safe space, and a tool for healing before I was aware of it. I came from a dysfunctional family with a lot of abuse and a suicide attempt led to a diagnosis of mental illness when I was a teenager and hospitalizations. I use art to cope with the symptoms of my trauma and mental illness. I usually work when I'm in a dark mood or I'm having a lot of anxiety. And uh, some of the mediums I like to use are text and writing, um, house paint because it's cheap and affordable. And I love the way it flows and it covers a lot of area. Um, I like to paint on the floor. Um, I also like sewing. And uh, when I was young, my mother wouldn't let me sew or create. And so now as an adult, I can sew whatever I want. And I get to take that power back from her. Um, like Isa, um, 
I used to love to write in the hospital and I started writing my solo play in the hospital, not knowing that it was going to turn into that. <laughs> Later on when I performed it, I got so much um, feedback and support from my audiences. And that's what really helped me come out and identify as an artist with mental illness for the first time. I soon realized that my story could be anyone's story and the personal leads to the political. So we just have to keep using our voices and telling our stories. Right, Issa? Yeah, I, I look at it as, as no other choice, really, for me. Um, I, um, uh, my life is informed by my getting, my development mental illness and having been hospitalized and the trauma and the things that I've been through, I, it's informed my life. So I, I think it's wise for me and maybe others to use that, you know, use, use, turn your vulnerability into a strength, you know, um, otherwise you're hiding and you'll always have that hide that, that veneer of what's that person got to hide, you know, that, that sometimes, uh, people can see through that anyway but it's it's like a necessary wall that you're putting up between yourself and society so yeah, yeah. thank you <laughs> and thank you thank you so much for a thoughtful discussion y'all i would like now to introduce you to karen Gormandy, studio director par excellence at fountain house gallery and studio who will show you what takes place at the studio in, in Long Island City. Take it away, Karen. Hey. Karen Gormandy, director of Fountain House Studio, and we'll be introducing you to the incredible work that takes place at Fountain House Gallery and Studio. Established by Fountain House in 2000, Fountain House Gallery sells original works and collaborates with an extensive network of artists, curators, and cultural institutions. Recial, recent projects include our partnership with New York City Mural Arts Project on West 34th Street, a partnership with Saks Fifth Avenue Foundation to display large scale work by Oswaldo Cruz in multiple windows at the flagship store on Fifth Avenue and an exhibition at the Lori M. Tisch Gallery as part of the 10th annual Real Abilities Film Festival. Fan House Gallery embraces artists both emerging and established. Trained and self-taught, we cultivate artistic growth while challenging the stigma of living with a mental illness. In 2017, we expanded our gallery programming by opening Fountain House Studio in Long Island City. The studio provides artists living with mental illness a space to work side by side with others in a setting that reduces isolation and fosters a supportive community. We provide space, supplies, peer support, mentorship, and workshops to help our artists develop and grow. Our goal is to create an environment that encourage each artist to hone their craft as well as one that fosters experimentation. Our members produce works that reflect the world back to us art that comes from a place that is raw, courageous, bold, bittersweet, and beautiful. Artists reflect on our collective humanity and bear witness to their experience in justices and their triumphs from homelessness, homelessness, incarceration, and mistreatment to the communities they have built like this one that we have now that has thrived because our artists have shown up and kept on because they bring with them their resilience, incredible talent and strength. In my years working at Fountain House Gallery and Studio, I've seen artists' lives change when they, they see emerging before them something they have created. I've always been pleasantly surprised by what 
people arrive believing about themselves, what they can't do, and invariably prove themselves wrong. The focus on the desire to just try or stay with something in spite of the impulse to give up is remarkable. It spills over success at one thing can always lead to success at another. In the future, I hope to see our gallery artists realize that the chorus of voices telling them what you cannot do is not their theme song. It is important to find out what they can do and excel at that rather than focus on what they can't. So I hope the doors keep opening for them in art because we have many talented people who deserve a break or in whatever way, shape or form, they choose to flex their creative muscle. My name is Sheila Horn. I'm an artist here at the Fountain House Studio and Gallery. I work in many different media from sculpting to drawing, painting with watercolor or acrylics, and I have a current passion for doing things with epoxy resin. I come from a background of physics and communication arts, radio, TV, film, and coming into Fountain House has allowed me to apply my practical scientific way of thinking to art. And it allows me to experiment with these different media like the piece you see in front of you that includes collage and paper cutting and a little bit of polymer clay and a tiny bit of resin I think is in there. But a lot of things that I have learned from my time at Fountain House um, came together in this piece, which is a little bit different from my usual work, which is not quite so representational. It's more abstract. I am inspired um, by my history in science, um, by nature, by sometimes another artist's work, whether it's a musician or a dancer or somebody just doing their own off the wall thing. It makes connections in my brain that cause me to want to create something myself. Also, I am inspired when I see something that I know someone else does not see the same way I see it. And I strive in my work sometimes to reproduce it in whatever medium tickles my fancy at the time to create, recreate it and show someone else what I saw and how I saw it. The staff, Karen, Amanda, Ariel, they were all very supportive and encouraging and they helped me to understand why my art is art, especially my sculpture of the blue Himalayan poppy in the next year, because it was the culmination of that science and art coming together with um, my resin materials, the polymer clay uh, stems for the flower, the research I did to find an unusual flower that I'd never seen before, and um, finding the wood clay that I used to make the grass and the wood block. And that's you know, combining all these mediums and making them hold together and not just fall apart. I had to do research on types of glue and paint that would work with them. And so it, it was the culmination of everything I've learned and the way I think and accepting my ADHD and using it in my art instead of letting it frustrate me. And so becoming part of the Fountain House artist community opened up a whole new world for me that was always in me. I just didn't know it. Participating in the virtual programming during lockdown has been a literal lifesaver. I can't even find the words to tell you how important those weekly Zoom meetings and the gatherings of us artists and the things we learn and the things we share have been so important to just getting through this together and continuing to grow in in our art and in my art and um, Fountain House Studio and Gallery have allowed me to recognize and place value on my creative side and I always say that science is art is science is art is science because to me they're completely intermeshed I can see the art of the universe and I can see the science of the art hi my name is Angela Rogers I'm an artist at Fountain House Gallery I paint, I draw, and I make creatures known as poppets. There's a piece in the show called Adjustment, and it is inspired by the tarot card Justice, and it's for sale today. I 
had brain surgery in 2012 and had a near-death experience. And when I came out of the hospital, I began wrapping sticks and forms with yarn and string and wire and charms. And eventually they turned into creatures and they began to tell me who they wanted to be, what they wanted to wear, what charms they wanted on them. And I began to listen to them more and more. And every time I make one, I'm hoping it will get a good home and somebody will love it and care for it and put it in a sacred space in their home. The favorite puppet of mine was in a show called At the Table. And it was curated by Monty Blanchard of the Folk Art Museum. And it allowed me to make a piece called Spirit Doll for Anthony Bourdain. And the spirit doll was there and I wrote a poem and it enabled me to give a tribute to him because he was so important to me in my life and gave me such joy and pleasure. The Fountain House Studio is out in Long Island City. They all were creating one body of work. I had time to spread out and work on this and it was really a luxury. It was a great experience for me. I have bipolar disorder. And when I'm in a mania, I'm very productive. I'm very prolific. I'm bouncing off the walls. I feel really good. But when I crash, I feel really bad. And I'm in a deep, dark place where I can't get out of my house. I isolate. It's very hard to get out of bed. Um, but if there can be a way that I can get up and go to the subway and get on the train and go to the studio, I know that when I walk in, I'm gonna be in the zone. There's a zone you walk in into the studio. You're inspired here um, to make great art. I see people making great art and I get moved to make great art myself. And I just feel like Fountain House is a place where you can share information about your mental illness uh, without the stigma or shame around it. It's become so critical and crucial and meaningful in my life as an artist and as just a person living in New York City. My name is John Sudev. I'm a multimedia artist that works in multiple mediums, ranging from charcoal to art scale puppets, which I have done with professional arts workshop. Um, I have a bachelor's degree in studio art and media studies from Hunter College. I do sketches of people in public places. I've been doing it for about several years or so. I started back in 2011. So a friend, a friend is a professional artist in the game industry kind of pushed me into um, sketching people in public places. And I, you know, it, it evolved from there. Um, I've also done that trap paintings in undergrad. And that, there's like these huge, like five feet by five feet, large scale paintings. And uh, yeah, that was, that was quite fun. I, I love that stuff, honestly. And uh, yeah, I've also done my share of self-portraits. These days, I primarily work with watercolor and ink drawings. So I'm also trying to like learn, or rather relearn digital illustration, which is working with, with drawing tablet. And then, yeah, I've also done some comics work in addition to the comic books. Um, yeah, during the 90s. And so that's something that kind of shaped, shaped me as I grew up. Like it just kind of really just like shaped my imagination in addition to like reading like parts of fiction, I remember reading The Hobbit when I was in high school. I've done my fair share of fan art for, for comic books and video games. I first got involved with Fountain House Gallery in 2019. You know, I was quite lucky to kind of see a couple of um, works that some Fountain House artists were exhibiting here. And then of course, you know, I managed to make it to the, to the Long Island City Studio once where, you know, I got out to meet Karen Gorman in person. And you know, I kind of spoke to her about some of my interests because I remember showing her some of my subway sketches. and said, hey, you should turn this into a big series. Why aren't you doing more of these? Like, this is great. So my, my first show with Final House Gallery was the Art in Quarantine, which is last year. This was in March 2020. Uh, my folks have been more, mostly around myself and my relationship with, um, with friends. What does it mean to be an artist within Final House Gallery? Um, well, you know that it means you know connecting to talented individuals that I would never have met under ordinary nor under ordinary circumstances. And then, yeah, you know everybody is you know everyone is all about making art. It's a very supportive environment. You always learn from each other because everybody has all kinds of different skill levels. I'd say you know Fine Arts Gallery 
um, I guess it's like a high tie that raises all the boats. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Laurel, Sheila, Angela, and Joan for your wonderful works of art. For those of you who would like to support Fountain House Gallery and Studio, please click the donate button at the top of your screen. Now, I would like to add a few more words about Aggie before turning her to the inestimable Darren Walker for an intimate conversation. Aggie has been a regional member of the Fountain House Gallery Art Advisory Council and remains a member to this day. She has collected works by Fountain House Gallery artists, visited many times the creative studio space in Long Island City, and have curated a group exhibition in 2009 with the theme, Is White a Color? Which I had the pleasure to interview Aggie for the Brooklyn Rail. She is a tireless advocate for justice and racial equity, particularly ending mass incarceration, among many other reforms she led as the founder of Art for Justice Fund. She has supported the work of many outsider artists, just as founding out artists who live and work with serious mental illness do. As a longtime supporter and advocate, it is true pleasure for me to recognize my dear friend, Aggie, today for her work in criminal justice reform, commitment to uplifting artists' voices and advocacy in the intersection for art, social justice, and mental health. I will now reintroduce you to our beloved honorary Aggie, who will be in a conversation with her beloved friend, Darren Walker. The mic is your Darren, please take it away. Aggie, I am so delighted to be here to honor you on this occasion of this recognition from a remarkable organization, Fountain House, that has done work for many years at the forefront of advancing our understanding of mental health. And of course, you are the perfect honoree because you have worked at the intersection of art and social justice and mental health for many years. So it is appropriate that Fountain House honors you on this special occasion. And as I reflect on your legacy as a philanthropist, someone who founded Studio in the School, a person who led the Museum of Modern Art, and most recently with the creation of Art for Justice, your visionary idea, which was made possible through the sale of one of your great paintings, the great Lichtenstein. I would ask you to talk about Fountain House because you supported this organization for some two decades. So obviously you believe in Fountain House and its mission. So share with us why you have supported Fountain House. Well, uh, hi, Darren, it's great to see you. I'm so glad you're the one doing this. I first learned about Fountain House through Alex Herzan, whose family had always been very interested in Fountain House and helping it to go national. And um, I, I just went back then, I did a show and um, 
I did that and I just loved it. I thought that they were such a nice group. I met uh, a number that I liked and I bought some things that I liked and um, really enjoyed um, altogether all the interactions I had with them. So I, I liked them from the start of my relationship, which was about 20 years ago, 25 years ago or so. Indeed, you've been a longtime funder. And I think more recently, Aggie, the challenge of mental health and the criminal justice system has come to the fore. And you certainly saw that in Ava DuVernay's film, 13th. Oh. Um, you have learned about that through Art for Justice, this intersection of criminal justice reform and the challenges uh, that the mental health system, which has been under-resourced and not fully embracing the challenge of addressing mental health in our jails and prisons. And so let's talk about what you've learned and the work that you are doing to end mass incarceration and how criminal justice reform and mental health together need to be addressed. Well, I, I think you're very right with both things that the COVID, when COVID came about a year ago or over a year ago now, um, people didn't realize how serious um, incarceration was and the fact that people in prisons had no outlets that they needed. Well, you you have visited, you and I were in San Quentin together and we yeah. visited one of the prison blocks and you saw how small the rooms are. And so thinking right. about how you do social uh, hygiene, how you can do social distancing and the things that we in our homes are able to do and many of these prisoners were simply unable, as you say. And then the added challenge of mental health, which yeah. was exacerbating the situation. If you read the book, Just Mercy by, um, of, Brian you know, Stevenson. Brian, Brian Stevenson's book, it, it really gives you a, a picture um, that's pretty awful of, what people go through that are on death row or in solitary. There is a wonderful young, uh, he's not any more young, but a man that, that comes through in that book um, who he, Brian gets out of jail and there's a one wonderful thing, but there is a, another um, prisoner that does go to death row that um, if, Brian had been able to get in there sooner or uh, at the right time where people were a little more enlightened by what um, that should be in prisons, that prisons should not uh, incarcerate people forever or for a long time. They should look at each case by the case of what it is and see if they can um, either release the prisoner or put them in their homes where they can um, lead a de decent kind of life until they can be freed and then they will get have much more strength at getting back into um, everyday life which now you're you're speaking Aggie of the other the other uh, incarcerated man who was sentenced uh, to death, who yeah. suffered suffered greatly from mental health, from PTSD, from mm -hmm. Vietnam, and other traumas that were never treated. Yeah, and and it it was so sad, but um, it it nobody took that into account or thought this man needs treatment or needs help 
rather than being killed. And this is why um, I'm so much of an advocate for, um, you know, which is hard to put forth now, but for not having the death penalty. I think, Aggie, what you're saying is you're making the case first that an inordinate number of men, because we're talking on the death penalty, mostly about men and mostly about black and brown and poor white men, that mm. a significant number of them have suffered from mental health issues. And that has not been taken into account. And this is one of the reasons you are so fervently against the death penalty, because mental health is often an issue with the person who has been sentenced to death, and that is never taken into consideration. And treatment, certainly not in the prison system, because as you know from the a for j work, our system of incarceration has also become the largest system of mental health in the country, and this is one of the areas that a for j works on. Now, Aggie, there was a situation at Fountain House that I think resonates with what you're saying, because there was a woman, Deborah Danner, who suffered from mental health issues. The police were called, um, and Ms. Danner ended up dead uh, because her mental health issues were not understood by the police. And in our policing system, there is very little assistance and training for police or the resources for mental health to accompany the police or to provide services. This is one of the areas that I know a for j is working on. But Aggie, as we close here, I would ask you, what do you want to say to the donors, the supporters, the board, the staff of Fountain House, given your unwavering support for this organization. And of course, as you say, um, your uh, wonderful uh, friend uh, who brought you in um, and mm -hmm. Alex Herzon. And what would you want to say to them on this occasion when you received this very big honor? Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate it. But I want to say mostly that it, the more we can work on changing people's trajectory, people's way of living and to better uh, the world that they're in um, by, by going to places like Fountain House. Fountain House is a wonderful resource that there is always some way to get help through a place like Fountain House. They do all sorts of things that are uplifting and helpful for people and mostly they can come through their problems so um i i think the chances that are given to people should be pursued um fountain house does well and with this new opening they're having which is uh, statewide they will be able to show even more what they can do for people. So, Well, Agnes Gund, you are a star in the firmament of philanthropy and are indeed a national treasure. I want to thank you and congratulate you and say to you that Fountain House is deeply honored that you have accepted this award and we bid you adieu with Great, great gratitude. To conclude our program, I would like to turn it back to my friend and colleague, Dr. Ashwin Vasan, for some closing remarks. First, thank you again, again, to each and every one of you for joining us today. It is because of supporters like you who are committed 
in supporting Fountain House that we are able to continue, continue to improve health, increase opportunity, and reduce social and economic isolation for people living with serious mental illness. If you like to purchase any works of art shown on today's program, please check out the auction at the link below and please be in touch with us. We send you lots of love for now, lots of courage and plenty of healing power to all you, your loved one, and see you very soon. Over to you, Aswin. Thank you so much. See you soon. Thank you so much for joining our virtual event today. Your continued support is invaluable to Fountain House and our community of people living with serious mental illness. If you want to stay up to date on our programs, policy and advocacy initiatives, and other special events, please visit our website at www.fountainhouse.org to sign up for emails and follow on our social media channels. I hope you have found today's event both educational and inspirational and see yourselves as critical partners in the movement we are building towards a better, more just, future for people with living with mental illness. We hope to see you in person again soon, and until then, stay well.